Good afternoon. I am grateful to all of you and to ACSS for including me in this forum. Um, I am certain that I'm going to learn more from you than you learn from me, but I will do my part to suggest some ideas. Um, let me say that I'm going to be talking about some specific American examples, and I do not believe that one country can copy the examples of another. I think we must all adapt. So, but I hope that, that the examples that I offer will lead to some uh, broad principles that are, could be useful to you. My spectacles, sorry. So as Dr. Smith indicated, I spent uh, more than 30 years in the American Diplomatic Service. So I was a member of the executive branch of government. Uh, I was one of those people that your American counterparts needed to oversee. Um, and that was a good thing. I think that uh, I embraced that oversight role. I understood that to be part of what makes our democracy strong. Let me start off, if I may, with a few foundational ideas that inform my approach to the role of legislatures, of parliaments, to oversee the executive branch. I think that part of this flows from the idea that human beings are really not very trustworthy. I think that we heard about that earlier when James Madison was writing about angels ruling men. Well, we haven't reached that stage yet. So essentially, we have to have systems that keep people from trying to assume complete power. I'm sure you're all familiar with Lord Acton's dictum that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Yes, I have an amen from the back row there. Um, so the framers of the Constitution sought to build a system that provided balance so that no single power would have the temptation or the ability to assume absolute power. The US Constitution is that framework for us, and I'm fascinated by the fact that when I joined the executive branch of government, I know this is true of the military as well, I swore an oath not to a person or to a party or even to a nation, but to a set of ideas contained in the American Constitution. And there, of course, there's your basic civic lesson, the three branches of government, uh, which forms the basis of, of the system that we try to use. I also think that it's important to think about what I call non-chauvinistic patriotism, putting national interests ahead of my personal interests, ahead of party interests, ahead of institutional interests, and always trying to keep in mind what the broad national interest was. And that was the way I approached the oversight that I experienced uh, from members of our legislative branch of government. Um, and again, I acknowledge that I'm gonna offer you some US examples. They may not be immediately uh, relevant to you, but I think the underlying principles uh, are, are helpful. So I'm gonna offer four examples of how during my career I experienced legislative oversight, what that meant and what the outcomes were. The first one was oversight through the budget process and, and broad parliamentary process. Um, I was the deputy ambassador, the deputy chief of mission at the American Embassy in Guatemala. Our big policy concern at the time was reducing the violence inflicted by gangs and reducing the flow of narcotics through Guatemala to the United States. To do those things, the executive branch of government wanted to provide equipment and training to the Guatemalan security sector. But those of you who know Central American history know that US involvement in Central America and specifically the violent problem in Guatemala, the 36 year civil war there, raised real concerns about human rights. So one of the main people in the Senate who is responsible for deciding how money is spent, where money will be spent, took a very sharp interest in what we are doing with the security sector in Guatemala. And this senator sent an extremely talented and process-oriented staff member to Guatemala to talk to us about these programs and to meet 
with our Guatemalan counterparts and to look at the projects. And so we were under intense scrutiny to make sure that our programs with the security sector in Guatemala did not continue the sorts of human rights abuses that Guatemala had experienced for a long, long time. Frankly, this was a bit uncomfortable for the embassy. It forced us to take a very close look at what we were doing and what the potential consequences of our programs were. But I'm absolutely certain that in the long run, it improved our program. In fact, I was in Guatemala last month and I met with some embassy people who told me that the homicide rate in Guatemala had declined by 50% in the last 10 years. So the security side of the equation worked well. But at the same time, the human rights situation in Guatemala had improved or remained stable. So that concern was also met. And I really do think that was due to this very intense congressional oversight over the security programs that we were operating in Guatemala. Second example I've got has to do with legislative oversight through investigation. Now, you all have heard of famous investigations and hearings that our Congress has held. I think perhaps the best known examples are the impeachment proceedings against President Nixon and President Clinton. But investigations happen on a regular base, a, a regular basis, and include things like uh, investigating intelligence activities, organized crime, military operations, and even the use of steroids in professional sports. At any rate, when I was the American ambassador in Zimbabwe, we set about to build a new embassy building. And this was a very, very expensive building. So there were members of Congress who were concerned about how much this cost and had questions about whether or not the State Department and the embassy were managing the process well. Consequently, a group of members of Congress, both Republican and Democrat, came to the embassy, came to Zimbabwe to take a look at what we were doing. And again, this forced us to take a very close look at what we were doing, how much money we were spending, and to make sure that we had solid arguments for explaining why this was a good use of taxpayer money. The meeting that we had with the members of Congress was not always easy. They asked some very sharp and pointed questions about how we were spending money and whether or not it was a good investment. But working together with our colleagues in Washington, looking through our designs, our budgets, our, our needs, we felt like we had good responses to the congressional concern. Um, Sometimes these processes, these investigations, can become very partisan, very political. But the fact that this delegation had both Republican and Democratic members helped minimize the politicization of the process. And in the end, this, this group that came out to visit us agreed to support the new embassy project. And in fact, it was opened, the new embassy was opened just a couple of months ago in Harare. Uh, but again, I think this highlights the fact that congressional oversight forces the executive, at least in the American system, forces the executive to be sure of themselves, to take a good look at what they're doing, and results in an improved outcome. Third example I've got is legislative oversight through confirmation hearings. And I know that this is unique to the United States, in which our president nominates senior government officials, and the Senate has to think about it, speak to the nominees, and decide whether or not to confirm them into that position. My own experience was when I was nominated to be the American ambassador to Zimbabwe, and I knew that I had a confirmation hearing in front of me. The preparation that I went through for that confirmation hearing was long and arduous, and I lost many nights of sleep. I had books this thick of all of the possible questions that might be asked, how I should respond to questions about development assistance, about sanctions, about the entire range of the American relationship with Zimbabwe. In the end, the confirmation hearing was anticlimactic. It was not a big problem. But the work that I did to prepare for that hearing 
helped ensure that I was fully informed and ready to assume that position. And just as a side note, uh, the common wisdom among nominees is that if you act as though you have that job, before the Senate has confirmed you, you may not get the job after all. The Senate is very jealous of that process and controls it quite clearly. <laughs> the last thing I'll mention, an example of my own experience, is what I call oversight through informal or public means. From time to time when I was serving in Washington in a position, I'd get a friendly phone call from a member of Congress or a senior staffer inviting me to come up to the office and have a cup of coffee or have a casual conversation about some issue that they were interested in. Whenever I got such a phone call, I knew that something serious was afoot and that this was not the sort of invitation that one declined lightly. I'd always go and tell my boss, hey, I've been called up to the hill, uh, but I'd always go. There are a couple of different examples. One had to do with the establishment of a new office within the Department of State, uh, and the other had to do with the establishment of a permanent American diplomatic presence in Mogadishu, both of which were difficult issues and had pros and cons. Um, in, in, in both cases, even the administration was not entirely sure what it was that the United States should do. And in both cases, my being summoned to explain why we are trying to do what we are trying to do helped break a political logjam within the executive branch and ensure that those <coughs> programs went forward. So I think that, again, this is a case where the work to prepare, the work to offer the arguments for why we should do something uh, was the side effect of the legislative oversight and helped ensure that we were doing a better job. I also think it's absolutely vital that members of Congress, that parliamentarians, reach out to their publics. Here in the, country, in, in the US, we call that constituent relations. And it's sort of the first most important thing that congressional offices do is maintain correspondence and contact with constituents. Public meetings, hearings, speeches are other ways that members of Congress build support for their office and its work and their positions. I think that any time a parliamentarian can go to the executive and say, well, I represent public opinion. Many people believe this is important. That strengthens their ability to influence the executive and, and to exercise oversight. I also think that respectful and honest relationships with the media and use of social media helps improve communication both from the constituents to the parliamentarian and from the parliamentarian back to the people. Finally, let me just underscore the point made by Dr. Njai that academics, civil society organizations, and NGOs can be wonderful allies to members of parliament. When you lack the expertise, you need additional knowledge and information, uh, the CSOs and academics can help provide that. So again, I'm emphasizing this point. I understand that the US and Africa have different realities. We have different histories, different powers, different levels of resource, so don't think that I am suggesting that you all copy the American model. Uh, we're all engaged in trying to improve our own governance. This is the way the Americans are doing it. You will find other ways. That said, I think there's some useful principles, uh, broadly, broad ideas that can be useful to all of us. Again, expertise in budget and parliamentary process makes you stronger. If you really understand the budget process and can dig down to see where perhaps money is not being spent very well, or perhaps something is being hidden in a budget, that makes you a much more effective parliamentarian. To the extent that you can make common cause with 
people from other political parties. Standing shoulder to shoulder with people from other parties makes you a much more important and strong force when it's your turn to go and talk to the executive about a shared concern. Public sessions and information, constant communication with your constituents. Let the constituents know what's important and what you're doing about it and listen to the constituents to understand their perspectives. I think one of the things that we've learned is that people fe feeling disconnected from central government is a driver of marginalization and extremism. So everything you can do to be in touch with your constituents is a, is a powerful uh, way to strengthen your own ability to deal with the executive. And then finally, as I mentioned, I think that academics, NGOs, civil society organizations can be very useful allies in terms of helping provide the security that, or rather the expertise that you can use. <clears throat> Let me mention just a few words specifically about security sector oversight. Um, I think it's Vital to think not just about the uniformed people, but the civilians who work in the Ministry of Defense or in police headquarters. To the extent that you can understand the needs and concerns of the security sector, that will make you a stronger uh, advocate for reform where it's needed and support where that's appropriate. Balance, understanding their needs, listening to them, as well as explaining your concerns to them, uh, don't be all criticism or all support. Find the right balance there. And then finally, make sure you know what it is that you expect of your security sector. What is their mission? Is it border security? Is it territorial integrity? Is it the counterterrorism mission? Uh, is it civil and humanitarian work? Or is it some combination? of all of those things. The better you can define your expectations of the security sector, the better you'll able to exercise oversight over them. Finally, be proud, please be, be very proud of your role as parliamentarians. The oversight that you've got plays an enormously important role in governance, in society, and in economics. You know, your role is absolutely vital, and you all are, in fact, the bulwark against what Lord Acton warned us about, absolute power. Thank you very much.